Hi there, this is Delis Guyan and welcome to the Inspired Selling Podcast, the place where business owners and salespeople discover how to attract, convert and retain more of their ideal clients. And I've got a cracking guest for you today um, in Kian McLaughlin. I hope I said that nicely there, Kian from, from Ireland. So Ireland, um, Kian hails from Ireland originally, but has lived for um, many, many years in Sydney, Australia. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Kian. I'm just going to pop my glasses on. So Kian is the founder and CEO of Trinity Perspectives, a sales, sales training and consulting company specializing in win-loss analysis and sales transformation. And he is a 20-year veteran of the B2B sales industry, including senior roles in some of the world's largest software companies. Now, he's also a regular commentator in the mainstream media and an Amazon number one best-selling author, award-winning blogger and keynote speaker. Now, don't I just bring you the best? Welcome, Kian. I'm so excited to talk to you and find out more. So let's just kick off and look at what inspired you, first of all, to set up Trinity uh, Perspectives. I think probably two things, if I'm being entirely honest. One was a need to escape the corporate world. I'd been in big, you know, corporate roles for, in big companies and in, in corporate roles for the best part of 15 years by the time I became a cubicle escapee back in 2011 and <laughs> I was over it you know it felt like Groundhog Day it felt kind of like you know every week's a month every month's a quarter every quarter is the most important quarter there's ever been I felt that I'd stopped learning I'd stopped developing and growing and all I was doing was effectively just chasing a number each year so so that was a big factor it was the need to sort of try something different and um, and maybe you know branch out but I think the, the reason that I went down the path I went down was because Towards the end of my corporate career, I started, started to see a pattern happening again and again. And the pattern was we'd put a whole lot of time and effort and energy and blood, sweat and tears into a, into a sales cycle or a pursuit or a bid or whatever you want to call it. And, we, you know, it might take us weeks, months, even on occasions, years. Mm. And at the end, we'd either, if we were very lucky, we'd win or maybe we wouldn't win. But in either circumstance, we never really fully understood what had actually happened, what had transpired what had influenced the customer to make their buying decision, whether it was in our favor or someone else's. And so we moved on to the next one. We weren't doing any real analysis, anything beyond a sit down internally and a discussion about what we thought might have happened. And I just saw that as a, a, as a broken model. It felt to me like there had to be a better way. Um, and so I set out to, to, to try and solve that problem. And initially I started to do it while I was still employed. And then I realized that, if you're going to be going to customers and asking them to provide really detailed, frank, open, granular feedback, it makes it much, much easier to do it if you're a third party. If there's a little bit of separation between the vendor and the customer, it makes it easier for them to give that feedback. But also, when you have that inf information and insight, it makes it much easier for you, do, for you to do something with it. And so that was the that was the sort of the challenge I embarked on seven years ago, and we've built a business or I've built a business doing this now with companies all over the world um, in Australia, obviously in New Zealand in Asia in Europe and the U S fundamentally, we're just helping them better understand why they're winning and losing the big deals they're they're pitching for. And then we're actually moving into now much more around helping them retain their existing customers by us going and finding out what's working, what's not. So it's just really sort of, you know, voice of the customer, customer insight on steroids and then really using that knowledge to, to, to get better and to lift our game. And, and really, it's such common sense, isn't it, that you would want to do that. And yet none of the companies that I worked for ever, we, we never, ever analyzed why we yeah. won or, or why we lost a bit of business. We just, as you say, surged forward to the next one. And, you know, it's a win or a lose. And again, to the next one. And, and you know, I played sport all my life and it just strikes me as really odd. You see the best teams and the best sports people will always sit down and watch the game tape back afterwards and analyze their performance and analyze their competition and ask themselves what they can learn from it. And as an industry, we call ourselves sales professionals, but that professionalism doesn't seem to extend to analyzing properly why we win and lose and then actually doing something about it. So, so that to me was just broken. And yeah, so we yeah. set out to fix it. 
So, so let, tell us a little bit more then about this win loss. What, what sort of things were you, what sort of information were you gathering when you were having these conversations with uh, vendors and, and uh, buyers? Well, I think, you know, the first thing I'd say is a lot of the, this, the insights we got from customers were quite surprising. And a lot of the feedback we were giving back to vendors, they, they were very, very shocked by. Um, in many instances, they were very shocked at just how far away from reality they were in terms of understanding what had influenced the customer's buying decision. So, you know, I'll give you an example. We, we did a piece of work for a vendor a couple of years back and they won a, a huge piece of business. One, they didn't think they had any right to win. Um, when we sat down and did the debrief with the, with the customer, the, one of the first things they said was this vendor, their tender response was incredibly poor. It was so poor they nearly didn't get through to the first round. It was, you know, clearly it was cobbled together by different people and, you know, put together. It was like Frankenstein's bride and then thrown over the fence at five to five on a Friday afternoon. Was, <laughs> you know, and, and anyone you give that feedback to kind of nods and says, yeah, we've probably done that. You know. mm -hmm. But what happened was they did make it through to the first round and then they did a whole lot of different things, some big, some small, that spoke to their knowledge and their commitment and cultural fit and spoke to a whole lot of things that weren't about product and weren't about price because what we've seen, and this, this has been kind of proven now time and time again, is that your product and your price, which we think often determine if we're going to win or lose, that's actually your ticket to play. So if your product is way off or your price point's way off, you're not even going to make it to the start line or you certainly won't make it to the short list. But the, the question that should be in your mind is what takes us from the short list to the selected vendor? Yeah. And a lot of what gets you to that final step of the journey is, is your people and your purpose rather than just your product and your price. And that's what we kept hearing back from, from customers time after time. They spoke about, you know, the quality of the, you know, the individual's cultural fit, risk mitigation, the credibility, the experience, all of these things that were people and purpose related. And so I think gradually over time, and this, you know, I'm pretty dumb, so it took me a while to kind of come to this realization. I finally figured it out that, you know, as, as humans, we buy with our hearts and then we justify with our heads or, yeah. or maybe we buy with our hearts and our heads. But as an industry, we're selling to people's heads all the time. We're not yeah. understanding how important a role your gut, your heart, your intuition plays. And mm. so much of that comes back to the quality of our people and our purpose. So that was one of the big, big surprises, I think. Yeah. And when you talk about purpose, Kim, just expand on that because I know we talk about it and it, it, we are very familiar with that term. But yeah. I, I think particularly lots of my audience who are business owners selling to bigger yeah. businesses, yeah. This, they, they're experts in the field, but they're not such experts in the sales and marketing arena. And when we're talking about purpose, I'd really like to put some context around that. Yeah. So I, I think that's a great question. And if I was to cast my mind back six or seven years and someone had said purpose to me, I'd be like, oh, that's a bit fluffy. That's a mm. bit, you know, sort of woo woo, you know, or maybe it's something that sits on our website or whatever. But really purpose is, is something which is much more kind of integral. So what, why do we do what we do when we strip away making money and shareholder value? Why do we do what we do? Yeah. You know, what are we passionate about? Is it, are we passionate about helping small businesses grow? Are we ha passionate about um, helping uh, you, you know, people move uh, from legacy infrastructure to something that's going to set them up for the next 10 or 15 years. What do we genuinely care about as an organization and as individuals? And if, if that's something that you can connect to and you believe in and you're, if you're not paying lip service to, then my strong recommendation is to actually talk about that and mm -hmm. ideally find ways to connect up your purpose to the purpose of either the organization or better still the individuals you're dealing with. Yeah. So if they want, if they're a community based organization and their whole purpose centers around, you know, delivering a better outcome to, to their community or, um, you know, being the most innovative provider of energy and whatever it is, understand that first and then try and find a way to connect back to that because mm. actually purpose and storytelling and, you know, things that operate on a slightly different level to the, the prefrontal cortex, which is all about information and bits and bytes. That's the bit that actually influences us in terms of how we make our decisions. Yeah. Um, so we need to put much, much more focus on that. I'm not saying don't focus on product. I'm not saying don't worry about price. You absolutely need to tick those boxes. But then the question is, what else have you got? What else differentiates you? What, you know, 
what separates you from all the other people who can do the thing that you say you can do? Mm. And so much of that goes back to the quality of our people and the, um, the, you know, the honesty of our purpose and, you know, what we bring to the table. Yeah. And I think the other thing around purpose um, is, is about that message staying strong throughout the company. I call that keeping the red paint red. And I was uh, working with a company last week and what they wanted me to do was in fact to uh, really nail down the, the mission and purpose yep. and the values that, that sat underneath those. Mm -hmm. And they brought all of the managers in and, and I facilitated this afternoon it was just based on this mission purpose and values but it wasn't just talking about them it was getting examples of it yeah so what does this absolutely mean and then when we've done all of that it was right how are you going to keep this message strong keep the red yeah. paint red all the way through the business mm -hmm. so that it, it isn't like crimson at the top and then Correct. It's kind of red lighter red and then you've got white with a hint of pink and then how do we live those? And how do we live our values? How do we live? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And, and how do we articulate that to our, our customers as, as our differentiator from everyone else that does the same thing as us? And that was what we talked about last week. So I'm really oh. pleased we've hit on that. It, it, it really blew me away and I wasn't expecting it at all. The other thing is purpose then starts to become something that allows you to attract and retain the best people as well. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because mm -hmm. if you have the sort of organization that is very purpose driven, that has a, you know, something other than just making money that people can get out of bed and get excited about, then that's the sort of place people want to work because everybody wants to have an impact in some mm -hmm. way, shape or form. Everybody wants to leave a legacy in some way, shape or form. So our ability to, to give our employees the opportunity to do that is huge and then it begets just a, a you know a virtuous cycle from there so yeah it, it, so that was one of the things which really really um, took me by surprise um, mm. some of the other stuff that probably didn't take me by surprise but but frustrated me a little bit because I continue to hear it so why do we you know why do we think we lose deals well often we think we lose based on price and we think we lose based on you know, it wasn't a level playing field. They were always leaning towards Joe Blogs, and we were never, you know, really in the hunt. We were just making up mm -hmm. numbers, whatever. But actually, what we hear back from customers is, you just didn't, you didn't listen to us, or you didn't take the time to understand our needs. We we saw you as unprofessional, or we mm -hmm. saw you as high risk. You focused too much on your solution. You didn't focus enough on our problem. Yes. Your your content was generic. We could see you'd searched, you know, and replaced someone else's name with our name in your in your your tender document mm. you you know we, we saw you as too cheap we saw you as too niche we saw you as you know um not a good cultural fit our people we did one the other day and i won't name any names but it was a you know 20 million dollar piece of business and if i was to boil it all down to one thing the customer said they were they were arrogant right their, their product was a good fit. Their price point was right in line. They had a relationship with our internal partner that we do a lot of work with. All of that should have stood them in good stead. But all of us found them incredibly arrogant and we just didn't want to work with them. Gosh. And how did they take that feedback? Well, it was very difficult. And that's one of the things that we've learned over, over the years is if we engage with a new client to do this kind of work, we don't do it one-off. We do it programmatically. But the first thing we do is sit down with the senior leadership team and we say to them, are you up for this? Are you prepared to hear some stuff that isn't necessarily going to be pleasant to, you know, are you prepared to take your medicine? And by take your medicine, it doesn't just mean listen to this information. It means actually take action off the back of it. Because yeah. if you shine a light on, on this, then your customers are going to know that you now know this stuff and your staff or your employees are going to know that you now know this stuff. If you then try and sweep it back under the carpet, you're sending a terrible message. So you actually have to take action. So the best practices or the best clients that we have are the ones that take it on the chin and then go away and start taking action and taking action and close the loop and feed it back to their customers and say you know that thing that you told us well that was very hard for us to hear and this is what we've done as a result and we hope that maybe the next time you come out to market we might have an opportunity to work with you, or, you know, that kind of yeah you know. particularly with something like arrogance because that that's a sort of an, an inherent behavior that can sometimes be a, a tricky one to improve on. They have to start and, and work really hard to change the habit of the way the, the, the tonality, the way the, the words that they're using and so on. 
Well, that's led to a whole piece of work that we're doing because so I, and I probably didn't explain it properly. So when we started out, I thought doing this was 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 our business. We'll give yeah. you the insights. Now you go away and work on them. And, you know, and then I realized that actually that's kind of all that's doing is giving you a better understanding of your current state. It's not yeah. necessarily improving your future state. So now we go much further down the road and we help the clients that we work with in some areas to take action on some of these things. So we will do a piece of work for this particular client around soft skills and mm -hmm. um, you know active listing and a whole lot of things which aren't about product and aren't about technology, but but they're about how we interact as people and how we how we listen and how we respond and the what we're portraying in the way we the way we talk and what we're portraying in the way we listen. So we're going to do a whole piece of work with their across their entire sales force because we when I said that to them. They weren't surprised and that was probably the worst thing of all you know they're like yeah yeah that's probably that yeah yeah we yeah so so that's that and, and quite often that's what happens i'm I, i'm sorry to say quite often when we give feedback it, you know vendors are like yeah no it probably makes sense even if it's quite negative feedback you think well, hang on a second surely you should be shocked by this they're like well you know we kind of suspected that but now you've got it from the horse's mouth from the customer so we can't we can't disagree with it, so we should probably take some action on it. I mean, that's yeah. extraordinary to hear, but it happens all the time. Time, yeah. Well, I've got a, 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 a very close friend, actually, and she is the um, head of learning and development for one of the big banks here in... Okay. In right. So they have these, what they call the beauty parade. So they'll put out, you know, a request for, for tenders. Yes. And then they select from there, just as you referred to before. Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to her actually just last week about it. And what is it that she loves? What is it that she hates? And she said, you know, with the, that, the bank now, or she now, um, has introduced this conference call and everybody gets a number. So if it was, they wouldn't know who the other ones were. So let's say there was half a dozen on this conference mm -hmm. call. And let's say I was number one and I would say, I'm number one. My question is, and I would ask my question so that they're actually allowed to get some sort of insights. Okay, good. But she said, then there's those who come and tell us what our problems were. Well, we told them what our problems were. We know yeah, very yeah, yeah. clearly what our problems were and are and, and what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. she said but the ones who made the greatest impression on the, on them was the ones who said and companies that we've worked with in a similar situation to yours what we found was this and here were the pitfalls and here's what we can help you with and here are some insights that we can bring you and it was and it really goes back to that kind of trusted advisors situation Absolutely. status again Absolutely where it's not about product and service it's about the problems that you can solve but as they had already identified that it was good that they reviewed those but she wanted more yeah we, i think i think that's such it's so um uh undervalued the importance of that there's a client i know and one of the things they do is they talk about some of their failed projects they said yeah. we've had some failed projects mm -hmm. and this is what we've learned and this is how we've address those gaps so that the next time around so they're not pretending that it's everything sweetness and light that they you know every project they've ever had and, and they even and this to me is just blows me away because you know reference calls aren't as, as valuable as they used to be back in the day when you were saying oh i'll introduce you to one of my clients because now what happens is because everybody's so connected as soon as you put up a slide with any logos i'm scribbling that down and i'm immediately reaching out to my connections and, and i'm already doing reference calls behind the scenes but if you, as part of your reference checking, introduce me to a client that had a failed project or a project that had a lot of issues or something, and then you got through it, that would be a really, it would be a huge point of differentiation to be that open and that candid to say, look, yeah. not all of our projects have gone brilliantly. Here's what we learned. And by the way, you can talk to one of our clients. They're still with us. We had some issues. This is what, I just think it, you know, it's, it's treating yeah. people like human beings and not pretending we need to be uh you know winning on all fronts and that's a lot of the stuff that we hear when 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 customers talk about why did we pick these people you know we liked them we trusted them they were you know they were really really good at, at understanding our problem and then playing back to us in their language how they felt they could deliver an outcome for us yeah um you, you know there's a whole lot of little things that the best and the brightest do that everyone else is just 
I don't know. Just, just don't do it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So mm -hmm. if you were to pick out, let's say, the top three um, tips that you would share with my audience to help them uh, position themselves better with their yep. potential buyers, what would they be? Well, I think the first one I'd say, and I'd say this head and shoulders above the rest, is to answer the so what question. Um, what I mean by that is that if you picture an interaction with a, with, with a client or a prospective client, we have this kind of show up and throw up mentality where we just get into pitch mode and let me talk about my solution. My it, it's only relevant unless we're giving them context. So yeah. information in isolation is is just totally pointless. We've got to find ways to to contextualize. So that could be through telling stories as you described. Yeah. So this is what we did with another client in a similar industry and boom, mm -hmm. boom, boom. Great, now you're giving me the information and you're giving me context around it. Don't tell me that you've got, you know, um, a thousand employees because why should I care? Tell me that you're, you've got really uh, good employee loyalty and that means you've got tenure and you've got much better experience and, you, and I can benefit from that. Perfect, mm -hmm. great. So I think we used to do an exercise in a business I was in where you do your dry runs before a big pitch and you would invited some of your colleagues and they'd all get a piece of cardboard and they could hold it up and it said, so what? On it. And so every time you gave a piece of information without giving the context in isolation, they got to hold that. And they took great pleasure in holding that card up. Yes, I bet. It forced you, it forced you to give context around the information. So I think that would be a big one. The second and, thing and I would say. Could I just add to you, Ikean, because I absolutely agree. And three words that I share with everybody that I work with is which means that. Because it, it forces you. It absolutely forces you to give the context. And, and it, the more times you give, you say, which means that, it takes you deeper and it gives you deeper context. Um, you don't have to use those exact words, but that's what you're doing. You're going deeper into the, uh, the so what, really. You're yeah, you are. The so what. Yeah, you are, 100%. So I think, that's, I think we're, we're kindred spirits in that sense. Absolutely, to us, I completely yes. agree. The second one I'd say, and you know, this is in no particular order now, but it's, you know, you know, there's that add value, that expression, which almost means nothing anymore. But, yeah. but actually what it means is, that, you know, value just like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So we need to understand what, what people care about and then connect that back up. And that's where the value comes from. So I think the best salespeople and, 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 and businesses in general give value in every interaction. They don't just say oh you buy our thing and then we implement it or whatever and then you get some value we mm. find ways to give value in every interaction mm. because i think if we just start to treat customers like customers before they ever become customers they're going to be much more inclined to think well this is what these people are going to be like to work with they're going to be mm. good because they've been good all the way through the process yeah, yeah. So that would be the second thing i'd say is little it doesn't have to be big stuff it can be little little stuff all the way through but just mm. What it does Give is great examples, Ken. Could you? Oh, so so yeah, absolutely. I'm terrible. I always forget to give examples. So yeah. so uh, you know, if if for example, you, you and I were talking about something, and and it's a topic that we're both quite interested in, and there's a book I know that I think you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. I just you know, pop on Amazon. I get the book and I send it through to you with a little note. Or mm -hmm. if we're chatting about something, and I come across an article, and I go to LinkedIn and I post the article, but I pop your name in and I say, Dennis, remember we were speaking about this. You might find. So like tiny, tiny things, yeah. but it's the thought that counts. Mm. And what that does, apart from anything else, is it triggers reciprocity. It triggers that you're more inclined now to want to reciprocate because as a human being, that's how we interact. So if I do something nice for you, no matter how small it is, then instinctively you, you store that away and you want to reciprocate. Mm. And how you reciprocate might just be returning my phone call when I reach out to you or responding to my email. And that's absolutely perfect. Yeah, yeah. So I think... That's a really, really important one. Yeah. And the last one, and, and you know, there's a million others, and I, I'm sure you have a million, but, but for the purposes of time, focus on your customer's customer, I think is yes. a really, really important one. Brilliant. So we have this tendency to focus on the person across the table from us or you know, the one that we're sending the email to, but almost always they have either an internal stakeholder or you know, other business group or an external customer or someone else that they're actually doing the thing for. So quite often they're an intermediary. So don't just think I have to sell you this thing or I have to do this project. Think, what are you trying to achieve for your third, for your audience? Yeah. And how do I get around the same side of the table and say, right, how are we both going to deliver on this? Mm. Because I think 
it's not it, it's not up to us to just flick them flick past the the technology or the the product and say right now you're on your own it's okay let's sit down let's i'm on your team let's work this through together it's a really really subtle one but it's it's yeah. it's massive isn't it huge yeah and because hardly anybody's doing it no I can't imagine my friend who I was talking to you about before, um, the head of learning development. I can't imagine any of her vendors have, have said, right, let's get on, get around the table because yeah. I'm working with you f to deliver for your customers. Yeah. Because that's what yeah. it's all about at the end that's of the day. 100%, because if she's head of learning and development, then she's got a whole lot of different business units inside the bank who, you know, go to her and say, I want to train my team. So they, they're all of her stakeholders. What will help me understand what are the timeframes that you're working to? Mm -hmm. What are the constraints? How can we help in terms of how we structure this and how we do that, whatever? What are the issues you've had with other providers in the past that we yeah. can make sure we avoid? All of that sort of stuff. It, it would be music to her ears because, because what you're saying is, we're in this together you know we're a safe pair of hands we've done this before yeah indeed and, and this latest project is performance management they're putting a whole new performance management structure in so it's all about the people 100 percent. and then it's not just about the direct people it's the people then that follow on from them that you know yep. the ones who have to learn how to uh carry out a good performance management review but then it's the people that they're reviewing yeah yeah. So you it's can, really you interesting. Can and it, you can do things. You can do things there and say, "Look, help me understand what your KPIs are and what your milestones are, and maybe we'll put some payment triggers in place so that until we, until you hit that KPI, then you you only trigger the second payment to us." And so, so you know, really kind of connect it up, even in the yeah. commercials or in the legals, and say, yeah. "This is how committed we are to delivering on this outcome, rather than we're going to dump and run," which yes. which happens all the time. Yeah. So, I, so I think it's it's almost like a mindset thing. You, you know, it's having that the heart of a teacher rather than the soul of a salesperson, if you yes. know what I mean. Yes, indeed. Kieran, I could talk to you all day because there's so much that we could dig into here. So maybe you could come back another time and we can okay. have another interview. Um, but in the meantime, um, I didn't ask you to prepare for this, and maybe you haven't, but have you got any books that you would recommend for our audience? As well as your own, of um, course. <laughs> Uh, well, I have mine, but I wouldn't recommend that. No, I'm only teasing. No, look, I think there's a few. And, I, you know, the sort of books I read aren't all kind of directly on sales per se, because I think a lot of selling is about people interacting with people. So I'd say anything by um, Dr. Robert Cialdini on the, the power of influence and persuasion, mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. Um, there's a fascinating book by uh, Daniel Pink called To Sell is Human, mm -hmm. which I think is a really, really good one. Um, I, you know, you you and I both know Tony Hughes, and I think his book Combo Prospecting is is a really interesting mm -hmm. one as well yeah. because it, it it just tells people what to do. Don't go single threaded. You know, you need to have a multifaceted approach. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think there there are a couple just off the top of my head, but Fantastic. there's some great books out there. Oh, yeah. sorry, one more. Um, Mike Adams wrote a book recently on storytelling in business, the the seven stories every salesperson must tell, and I've read that recently, and that's that's a cracking read as well. So that's Fantastic. Really and I've just um, listened to an audio book actually by Daniel Priestley, uh, Keep oh, yeah. of Influence, and I'm listening to it again. Now, that's not something I would normally do. I'd be moving on to the next book. It was fascinating. I absolutely loved it. Five well, I, I can tell you, I not only have I read that book, but I also did that program a couple of years ago, The Keep of Influence, in Australia. And right. yeah, so I, I can certainly uh, speak to the value of that as well. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So, Kian, if any of our audience would like to get in touch with you, how might they do that? There's a couple of ways. Uh, so they can just uh, search for me on LinkedIn and connect and have a chat that way. I'm normally pretty responsive, so Kian McLaughlin. Or they can head to the uh, Trinity website, which is trinityperspectives, all one word, dot com, dot au. Heaps of videos, blogs, resources, all freely available. We don't gate the content, so you know, feel free to come and browse and, and, and reach out. Um, I think, you know, Dillis, we talked about it before we jumped on the call that you and I have a shared philosophy, which is, you know, sales can be a tough gig. And if there's ways that we can help elevate people, give them, give them some things they can use and then they become more successful, then that's, you know, that's something I think we're both passionate about. So Absolutely. the more people yeah. that want to reach out and grab our stuff or ask me questions, the better. Fantastic. And I just want to... Um, Re reiterate your name really because it's not Kieran it's Kian C-I-A-N 
Yeah. That's right. Kian McLaughlin. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Kian, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, stay on the call and um, I'll speak to you again very soon. Thank you. Look Brilliant insights. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Wow, what an insightful interview that was with Kian McLaughlin. So, um, as I always say, if you haven't joined my free Facebook group, Inspired Selling, please pop on to Facebook book, just um, search for Inspired Selling and come and join us. It's a great place to ask questions, to get support, to give your own insights and collaborate with others, but more importantly, become known for what you do. So until the next time, have a fantastic time selling and see you soon. Bye for now.